A man originally from Huntington has now officially been connected to one of the most high-profile murder cases in Canadian history. But his criminal record started here in West Virginia when he was just a child. Reporter Leslie Rubin, who broke the now international story of the exhumation of Franklin Romine's body from the Putnam County Cemetery, has exclusive new details about the West Virginia crimes that helped detective link him to the infamous rape and murder of Sharon Pryor. Franklin Romine only lived to be 36 years old, but had a criminal history that started when he was a child and continued until his death in 1982. He jumped back and forth between West Virginia and Canada for years, committing all kinds of different types of crimes, from thefts to forgery. And now it's certain he was the man that raped and killed Sharon Pryor when she was just 16. Her case unsolved for nearly 50 years until DNA taken from his grave in Putnam County proved to be a match to her killer. But it was a rape in Parkersburg that happened a year before Pryor's death that would help Canadian detectives zero in on Romine as a suspect in their infamous cold case. Former Parkersburg Police Chief Bob Newell was a young patrolman in February 1974. He remembers responding to a call about a break-in and sexual assault here at the now Homecrest Manor Apartments on the city's south side. Now, I believed her, I can tell you that. Now, when she told me what happened and I saw the circumstances, I, I believed it, it happened. It wasn't one of those deals that I was, was skeptical myself. You know, the evidence was there. A 23-year-old single mother who worked as a waitress told police Franklin Romine had broken out a window of her apartment, came in while she was sleeping, and raped her. He threw a $20 bill down before he left. Her four-year-old son was in the next room. The child actually woke up, and because uh, she, you know, heard he uh, heard the glass break and the commotion. Uh, and they're talking and so forth, and she convinced him that uh, everything was okay, get back to bed, and which he did. And, um, and she, again, you know, just conceded to the fact that this was going to happen, and, and uh, you yeah, know, probably for her safety and safety of the child, just, uh, just laid there and, and until he was finished, and again, prayed that he, le that he left, and he did. In her testimony, she told a jury that Romine told her he had wanted her from the first time he saw her, and he was going to have her even if it meant he had to kill her. She said she knew him through work, he'd come in and get coffee, and he'd asked her out before. Noel remembers how extremely difficult it was to get a rape conviction in the 70s. There was no DNA to prove guilt, and in 1974, when the crime happened, rape was a capital crime in West Virginia, punishable by life in prison. Juries were very cognizant of that fact, for uh, and, and certainly, Again, they, they always question, you know, how the woman got in that situation to begin with. And unfortunately, I mean, that's way, just the way it was. And then when you tack on the fact that when you find this man guilty, he he's eligible to go to prison for the rest of his life without parole. Uh, I mean, they really balked at, at convicting him of that. And uh, so in, in many, many cases back then, that you know, they, the prosecutor would take a plea of like malicious assault, felony assault, which was like one to ten. Um, things like that uh, to get somebody to plead guilty and avoid a trial because it, just, it was just difficult. But a jury did find Romine guilty. He would be the first rape conviction in nearly a decade in Wood County and the last capital rape conviction before state law changed to allow different degrees of sexual assault. A jury recommended mercy, but by the time the trial and conviction came, it was 1976 two years after the crime. Why did it take so long to go to trial? Romine had posted bond after his arrest and fled to Canada. Sharon Pryor was abducted on March 29, 1975 on her way to meet friends at a pizzeria. Three days later, her body was found in a field in Longueuil, Quebec. She'd been brutally raped, strangled, and beaten to death. It would be six more months before Romine was tracked down in Montreal and extradited back to West Virginia for the rape trial that started in February 1976. Knowing what we know now about Romine, he was probably obviously a sociopath all along. It wasn't anything he'd learned. You don't learn that, but um, you know, he, 
he, he was, he's a typical example of that. Detective Sergeant Eric Rassico, the lead cold case investigator on Sharon's case, describing Romine's movements as a game of catch me if you can to the convict. We know for sure that he was always uh, uh, playing hide and seek with law enforcement. So um, he was uh, always going back and forth from Canada to the U.S. Uh, he was trying to avoid uh, an arrest. Uh, so uh, he was always uh, playing uh, with us. When Canadian detectives got enough for a DNA profile of Sharon's killer from her clothing left at the scene, they were able to zero in on a last name through genealogy sites. Franklin Romine stood out. He had a criminal history in Canada and that rape conviction in West Virginia. That led them to West Virginia State Police Sergeant Eric McClung. One of the print cards that we produced here from criminal records actually had an address for two blocks away from where she was abducted, where he lived at in Montreal. I, I thought we got, we, we've got our person. In September 1976, Romine was sentenced to 20 years for the rape and one to 15 years for the burglary in Parkersburg. He'd go to Moundsville, a prison he was notorious for escaping over the years, before his conviction was overturned by the West Virginia Supreme Court in 1980. He was awarded a new trial because of an inaccurate instruction that was given to the jury. But instead of opting for a new trial, he pleaded guilty to second degree sexual assault. He'd already served enough time under the new sentencing guidelines to get out of prison, and he was released in 1981. He returned to Canada, where he died in 1982. My understanding is that he was, a, by trade, he was a, a truck driver and that he run a route between Canada and somewhere in the United States. Now police want to know if he's responsible for unsolved cases. His DNA taken during that exhumation last month is now going into the combined DNA index system known as CODIS. It's an FBI computer software program that operates local, state and national databases of DNA profiles from convicted offenders, unsolved crime scene evidence and missing persons. If the DNA is already in CODIS, and there's a hit, then there's that gives them grounds to open the investigation up and work it further. For McClung, an investigator for nearly 30 years, it's a fascinating chain of events for a case that could have never been closed. I've had people ask me, well, why are, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Well, her mother's still alive, and if you can give her closure, there'll be no prosecution. They'll, they'll be, you know, after the new story airs, and. It's it's a done deal, but it at least gives the mother an closure that they know who who killed their sister and daughter. A certainty that Sharon's killer isn't still out there. A closure her family didn't know if they'd ever experience. We'll always be your mom, your little brother and sisters who sat looking out that window that Easter weekend, hoping to see you walking on home. You may never have come back to our house on Congregation Street that weekend, but you have never left our hearts, and you never will. We love you, Sharon, now. May you truly rest in peace. You can catch up on all of our reporting on Franklin Romine by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. You can also read through documents, pictures, and listen to raw interviews on this case exclusively on WCHSTV.com. Reporting in the studio, Leslie Rubin, Eyewitness News.